Shabbat Shalom. Let's turn in our Torah portion. This week is entitled Shalach, Shalach, and it comes to us from Bar Midbar, Numbers chapter 13, 1, and extends through to Bar Midbar, Numbers chapter 15, verse 41. Um, I entitled this week's Torah portion um, a little bit of a funny title. Many people are wondering what I was going to be talking about. Ma Palim, Ma Apalim, meaning illegal immigrants. And how can you get that from this week's Torah portion? Well, the first question, the most important question, I believe, that was asked of the Mashiach after he had ascended and come down and spent that time with the disciples was, Master, will you at this time restore the Malchut to Israel? this time restore the kingdom to Israel. So what I want to be talking about today, I'm going to use two Hebrew words. One of those is ma'apalim, illegal immigrants. And another word is meraglim, spies in the Hebrew, meraglim. So we're going to be looking at the spies, the meraglim, and the ma'apalim, the illegal immigrants. Because Really today, what we're going to see associated with this Torah portion, that this Torah portion is going to jump all the way forward into our very lives today. Because first and foremost, we have to understand that we live in the natural world and we are going to de deal with spies and we are going to deal also with illegal immigration. Because this is a natural earthly principle, but it also is a heavenly principle that we're going to see in the Torah portion. That Yahweh does define who has rights to enter the land, who is a legal inhabitant of the land biblically, and who is a ma'apalim illegal immigrant. And also, does he want his people to go and spy Meraglim, spy out the land. And what land is it that we should have our eyes, our hearts focused on? And I know a lot about being a Ma'apalim. I've crossed many borders in my life and been an illegal immigrant. And I've gone through a lot of hard trials because of that, but come through to the other side. So I'm speaking not only from a biblical perspective, in a spiritual realm, but we'll be seeing in a natural realm. But today, also, we've got issues not only in this country, but with the global agenda of melting borders, where there is hard, hardly any definition to what a country is with the global agenda, with our southern border here in the United States being opened up, and the illegal immigrants that are coming in, and what their intended agenda is. So there's many things that we'll be looking at today. But just prior to the end of the age, Armageddon, the eternal restoration of Israel is the main subject that we find in Scripture. It keeps coming up again and again and again and again. Scripture records that the peoples involved in the end times are unmistakably identified as the house of Jacob, the flock of Jacob. So we need to understand how the flock of Jacob is to live. Are we to spy out the land, Meraglim? Are we to kick out the Ma'apalim, illegal immigrants? And what are we to do in this day and this age? Because I believe in the end of the age, you're going to see the restoration of the birthright seed, which is the flock of Jacob, the restoration of the birthright seed. But we've got to look at things in Scripture with equal weights and measures, right? Equal weights and measures. And we have to look at things in a balanced perspective. But my paradigm of understanding isn't going to be religion, it isn't going to be tradition, and it isn't going to be politics. It's ultimately going to be Scripture. You see, I believe that my calling is to blow apart the religious, political, and 
financial illusions for the Kiddushim, the saints in these days. Because it's all abound. It's all abound. So let's begin by defining truth. Because even before we get into this week's Torah portion, we have to clear up so many misconceptions. Let's define some simple truth. Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was an Ibri, an Ibri, a Hebrew. And we can see that this is spelled in the Hebrew with the Ayat Resh Yod. And it comes to us from Bereshit, chapter 14, verse 3. He, what did Abraham do? He abar, he abar, ayin bet resh, he abar, meaning he crossed over and he therefore became one who crossed over an Ibri. Isn't that our life? Isn't that what we are doing? We are crossing over from one soil to a better soil and becoming the people of Israel, the flock of Jacob, the house that Yahweh is building. You see, so it all begins by defining who we are, who we are in Yahweh will mean, are we legal immigrants or are we illegal immigrants? So we have to define, firstly, that Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was a Hebrew, Bereshit 12.6, one who crossed over. And that there was no Israel, let's be honest, there was no Israel before Yaakov, Jacob, wrestled with Elohim. Israel didn't exist. There was no Israel before Jacob wrestled with Elohim in Bereshit, Genesis 32, verse 28. Because if we're not speaking from the same point, then the whole waters are muddied, clouded, and a mess before we even get started. Yaakov also, Jacob also, wasn't a Jew. Bereshit 32, verse 8, he is Israel. Defining terms is extremely important in truth of Scripture. It's not very important if you're into religion. Not very important at all. At this point, I believe, maybe a few years ago, somebody got up and left because they just said, how can that guy say that Abraham wasn't a Jew? How can you say he was and hold the Bible in your hands? That's my question. And I literally caught the guy in the, in, in, in the hallway and tried to explain. But there was a stone wall. Nothing. Because if you're seeing through the lens of tradition and religion, then you're not able to see through the lens of Scripture. Now let's define the term Jew. Because what we see, Yehuda, Yehuda the Hebrew term Yehuda, comes from us. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 29 and verse 35. And the term Jew really is Yahudi, and it doesn't really appear until after or around the time of the Babylonian captivity, and it's first referenced in the book of Hadassah, the book of Esther, at chapter 2, verse 5. And we kind of got into that a little bit in Purim and got some feedback on that. I mean, there's many things that we have to look at, but before we even get into this Torah portion, I wanted to be clear that we were coming from the same, the same point of reference. Let's look at the Hebrew term merag, which is the spies. The spies in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. What we're going to see, the timing of this week's Torah portion, falls around Tisha B'Av, Tisha B'Av where the worst things that happened to Israel happened. The destruction of the temple, um, the destruction of the first, second temple, the kicking out of the land. And it says that in the traditions that this bad report that was brought by the spies, it happened on Tisha B'Av. We can see whether it was Nebuchadnezzar, whether it was Titus, whether it was settlements recently being disbanded. All of these things are brought forth around this time of year. Now we look at another term, Marpalim, the illegal immigrants. Because in the Torah portion, what were they to do when they came back and they brought a bad report and they were chastised? What did they decide to do afterwards? Well, let's go back. Well, yes, let's go back into the land then. But was Yahweh with them? 
And at that point, because Yahweh wasn't with them and they didn't have some credentials or some things with them, they are defined by Scripture as none other, if they had gone into the land, none other than the Ma'apalim, the illegal immigrants. So we need to make sure that if we're going to go into the land, that we are properly equipped and we are not called what? Immigrants. Very important when people are packing their bags today, thinking, I'm going to move to Israel. Because timing, what you have with you in your belief system is very important of whether you are defined as a legal resident of the land by Yahweh, I'm not talking men here, ultimately, or whether you are illegally there in the eyes of Yahweh, because what will be the outcome will be very different to those two groups of people. So this Parsha is really about the battle between believing Yahweh's words or believing our eyes. It's really like the two trees in the garden, isn't it? Is man going to live by experimental knowledge, the experimental knowledge of good and evil, which is reason, which is senses, or is he going to live by revelation and the Ruach HaKodesh? Revelation and the Ruach HaKodesh. This Parsha is also about occupying the land because there's negative connotations with that phrase today, especially in Europe, right? The occupation, the Zionist occupation. So we're going to be covering a lot of ground today and I hope to bring in both the political, the religious and ultimately the kingdom of heaven because we need to live that today. But we have to deal with the geopolitical reality of the world that we live in. We have to. Because you know what? There are thousands, may I say millions of brethren that are flocking, leaving the churches because they get the same sermons and the big things are happening in the world and nobody's addressing it. Nobody's addressing it through Scripture. And we're going to address those things because it's all right here built into the Parsha. And at the time of Yeshua... When there was teachings being brought forth by Yeshua and the disciples, was Yeshua using the word of Yahweh to address the political and religious situation? Or did he just do these happy, sappy sermons? No. He was very, very of the geopolitical situation and the religious perversion and the spies that were in the land. Oh, yeah, there's some spies. It's called Mossad. It's called the Skull and Bones Society. It's called the Illuminati. It's called the Bilderbergs that just met in Austria this week. Oh yes, there's some spies in the land. But there's also some open borders. And there's illegal immigration coming over. ISIS coming into this land to do what? You see, we need to be aware and we need to be secure within our boundaries of Scripture. So this Parsha is also about the occupation of the land. By what rights does one go up into the land? This is a question that maybe Brother Jacob in the back was thinking about. Do we have our rights, are they given to us internationally? Or are they racial? Or are they Zionist? Or are they scriptural? By what rights do you have to go into the land? These are the questions. The majority would say international. But then there's a huge group that would say, well, it's actually racial, even though we don't want to admit it's racial. It's really Zionist. But then there's a few people that say, no, it's got to be the Malchut Hashamayim, the kingdom of heaven, walking out on earth. And that means that it's scriptural. And that would be the group that I would communicate, address, and be from. Will we reason away our rights to the land based upon Jewish misconceptions, geopolitical misconceptions, or religious misconceptions? Be they, be, be they Messianic, Zionist, 
Christian Zionist? These are very important questions. And it's very sobering. Is it permitted by the nations that we go into the land? Or national law or international law or justice? Or does that even matter? Does it even matter? Or do Yahweh and covenant Torah and universal justice permit it? And does that matter? These are questions that I've pondered as I've gone through the portion this week. Chapter 13 and verse 1. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Send men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel from Every tribe of their avot, fathers, shall you send a man. So, this is really Yahweh's permissive will. Because how do we know that this is Yahweh's permissive will? It's not his perfect will. It's not his perfect will that they would send a force in to spy out the land. But you can't tell just from this text. You'd have to actually cross-reference it with Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verse 22. Because there you see that Moshe Rabbeinu said, And you came near to me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us. It is. We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again of which we must go up and into what cities we shall come. So the idea of sending Meraglim, spies, didn't originate with Yahweh, and it didn't originate with Moshe Rabbeinu. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 22 tells us that. But it actually originated with Israel itself. Yahweh uses their senses to do what? He uses their senses, and do we live in a society where it's all sense, it's sensory overload? We're walking around on our phones. I mean, the amount of screen time that we have each and every day. I mean, what we're reading, the conspiracy theories, the, the, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It blows my mind. But you see, Yahweh did what? He used their senses to test them. The Hebrew word here we'll see in the text is to uh, to see, to see. Everyone, a leader, we see in the scripture, they were looking for what? A nasi, a chief, a leader, or a prince. And they are tested first, tested first, and then all of Israel. Do a deep study on this. I, well, I just did a cursory study just for the teaching today. But if you actually look in deeply to the names of the spies that gave a bad report, you'll see the connection with what's going on in Israel today, in the political entity today. And ultimately, ultimately, the leaders and the conspiracy to bring a Nasi, a prince, we know it will be the anti-Messiah, up onto the Temple Mount. Now, are they going to take that throne that was at one time the throne in Pergamos, which is the seat of what? Satan. Remember, they moved that throne from Pergamos to Berlin and constructed it there. In fact, when Hitler spoke before crowds, it was in that very form. But then they later moved it, and where it is presently today, where? In Russia... Is it possible that they could actually move that up onto the Temple Mount? People could be doing sacrifices, and there could be a priesthood up there, a Levitical priesthood that's not according to Scripture, not according to the book of Ezekiel, and they are actually sacrificing to the throne of what? Hey, just went off on a tangent, but you look at the names, do a deep study, if you've got your Klein's etym Etymological Dictionary, that will really help you. But I did a cursory look, and I'll, I'll read through a few things here. And Moshe, by the command of Yahweh, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel, and these were their names. From the tribe of Reuben, 
Shamanu, the son of Zachur, of the tribe of Shimeon, Shaphatly loyal. But he wasn't actually Jewish. He wasn't from the tribe of Yehuda. He was actually a stranger that was grafted in because his father, his father was what? None other than a Kenazite. You know, he's famous in Israel and even famous in Judaism today. But he was a stranger, one who was grafted in, whose father was a Kenazite. And then we go on to read the son of Yehenu, in verse 7, of the tribe of Ishakar, Egal, which means he redeems, the son of Yosef, of the tribe of Ephraim. Now, of course, Ephraim, they hold the head, the Rosh, or Moshiach, Hoshia, which means salvation, the son of Nun. And verse 9, of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, my deliverance, the son of Raphu, verse 10, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, which means invading El, or El is my fortune, the son of Sodi, verse 11, of the tribe of Yosef, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, which means the invader, the son of Susi, verse 12, of the tribe of Dan, Amniel, which means my kinsman is El, the son of El, verse 13, of the tribe of Asher, Sethur, which means hidden, and it actually comes from the word satur, satur, which has the numerical value of 666. Satur, which actually can be connected with the Khazars. Can be connected with the Khazars. The son of Michael, verse 14, of the tribe of Naphtali, Nahavi, which means hidden, the son of Vobshi, verse 15, of the tribe of Gad, Gelul, which means majesty of El, the son of Malchi, Malchi, and verse 16, these are the names of the men that Moshe sent to spy out the land. So the ones that brought the good report, they're actually, their names mean this, salvation and fiercely loyal. Yet the ones that brought the bad report, and I'm telling you, you should actually dig into it a lot more than I did this week. This is what their names mean. Satan invaded their thoughts, hiding the majesty, deliverance, and redemption of Elohim. And that happened in the late 1900s at the formation of the Zionist Council with Theodore Herzl. That's what happened. Satan invaded their thoughts, hiding the majesty, deliverance, and redemption of Elohim. And it was put into the hands of conspirators and spies. And here we are, 115 years later, dealing with the fallout before Armageddon. And we need to know what to do. Because our borders are open and there are ma'apalim, illegal immigrants, not only in this country, but also in Israel. And we, as the people of Yahweh, need to be led not by the globalists, not by the Bilderbergs, not by the Illuminati, but by Scripture, soul Scripture. Because with that comes the keys for legal entrance into the promises that Yahweh has for us. And Moshe called Hoshea, or Yeshua, the son of Nun, Yehoshua. What happened? He, ha he added, or Yehoshua. In verse 17, And Moshe went, sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way southward and go up into the mountain. 
But where are the Levites at this point? Remember, they didn't have any land inheritance, did they? Didn't have any land inheritance. Note the differences in the leaders from the armies of chapter 2 in Numbers. There wasn't re- this really wasn't about a military campaign, whereas in chapter 2 it was. But this really isn't about a military campaign. The spies weren't to be looking at things primarily military, but were to bring a description of what? The inner quality of the land. What do you think of the inner quality of the land? And what do you and I think of the inner quality of the land today? You see, that's what we need to be looking at. The inner quality. What is the spiritual quality of the land? Because if you're looking with your eyes and your senses, you're not going to see the inner quality of the land. You'll be duped. Look at verse 18. And see, but see with more than your eyes. In, in Proverbs, Mishle, chapter 29 and verse 18, it is written, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that guards my Torah, happy is he. Happy is he. You see, look at eight things. Spy out eight things. See in vision. See eight things. Eight instructions. Four questions about the land. Because the land is more important than the people. How can you say that? That's what Yahweh says. The land is more important than the people. It's not called the promised people. It's called the what? You better look at the inequality of the land. You see, because today, oh, it's all about, oh, it's all about the people. The government really cares about the welfare of your children. It's all about... No, it's not about the people. Wake up. And with Yahweh, he is more interested in the land because he's prepared the land for his people. But it's called the promised land. So what we're going to see is there's four questions There's eight instructions, four questions about the land, because the land is more important than the people, because it's the land which is promised, not the people. We see, one, see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell there may be, two, strong or weak, three, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be four, whether it be tov, whether it be good, or And what cities there are that they dwell in, and whether it be five, tents, or in strongholds, and what the land is, six, whether it be fat or lean, and whether there are seven, is wood there or not, and be of tov courage. Be complete or perfect in gevurah, courage, and then number eight, the eighth thing, and bring the fruit of the land. Now... The time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So when was it? It was around Shavuot before Tishri. Thus, we can say safely, it was around Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av. Look at verse 23. And they came to the brook of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch from one cluster of grapes, and they bore it between the two of them on a pole, and they brought of the pomegranates and the figs. This is actually today the symbol of the tourist bureau in Israel. Isn't that fascinating? Because what they're asking the nations is, come and spy out the land, right? Come and spy out the land. But as we see... All are opposites. When we read those instructions, all are opposite. Verse 18, except for one. All are opposites except for one. And that is the reason to do what? Draw our attention to it. Strong or weak? Opposites. Few or many? Good or bad? Tents or strongholds, fat or lean, trees or not. 
So what's going on with the trees? Etzim. Etzim in the Hebrew. Why the concern about the etzim? Why the concern about the trees? Teh- um, tehillim, yes, Psalms, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. The zadik, the zadik are like etzim, are like trees planted by rivers of maim, waters. The righteous are like trees planted by rivers of waters. Psalm 92. The zadik, the righteous, shall flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. They are called trees of righteousness. And Proverbs, Mishle, chapter 11, verse 30, the fruit of the zadik, the fruit of the righteous, is an eight, a tree of life. What was Yahweh saying? Go and see if there's any righteous people in the land. Go and see if there's any righteous people in the land. Because if there were righteous people in the land, they would have merited what? Yahweh's protection. They would have merited Yahweh's protection and favor. And this, brethren, was the world view of the Zadokites at Qumran. This is exactly the world view of the Zadokites who were living at Qumran at the time and after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. Because if no righteous people were found, it would have installed what? Instilled great courage for them to occupy the land. You see, those that live down in Qumran, they believe that their righteousness... Their holiness, their purification would what? Guard them, protect them, and pour out Yahweh's favor upon them. This was their worldview. They were the inhabitants of the land and the only righteous priestly line inhabiting the land at that time. And they believed by the ritual immersion, keeping away from the Herodians, keeping away from the corrupt Ithamite line of the Levitical priesthood and the elevation of themselves as the pure Eliezer Zadokite line with ritual immersion in the mikvah, oh, that they would have divine protection from the heavenly Malachim angels to guard them and surround them in those days. This was their worldview because they understood that the land needed righteous people or righteous trees within it. Now today, you have to ask yourself, how many righteous believers is in, in Yeshua are there in the land? How many righteous believers in Yeshua are there in the land? There's about 13,000, that's all. About 13,000. And they're having their citizen, citizenship excuse me, stripped from them if it, come to li- if it comes to light that they are righteous believers in Yeshua. Do you realize that? They get their citizenship stripped from them if it comes to light that they are believers in Yeshua and they share that belief. Even if they're what's called Sabras born within the land from birth. Is that righteous? Look at the inequality of the land. There were eight things, five in favor and three against. Therefore, take the land. Take the land. When? Later? No, at once. Defenses and no trees, no righteous. Therefore, they had defenses, didn't they? But there were no trees. There were no righteous, so therefore the defenses are removed. That's the key. That's the key. If you are the righteous and you are within the priesthood, then you have the defenses all around you. But you can have defenses all around you and you're unrighteous and the defenses are removed. You see, it's all about were there trees or no trees. It seem or no it seem. 
chapter 13, verse 26, and they brought back word. And what we see is all five words out of the eight are in favor. Number one, they saw. Number four, the land is good. Number six, the land is fat. And number seven, there were no righteous. There were no trees. And number eight, yes, there's fruit. Let's take the land. And that is what the son of noon, that is what Caleb, and that is what they, that's what they saw. They saw that it was time to go up at once. And we continue to read on in verse 26. They brought, work, brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Verse 27. And they told him and said, we came to the land, one, there's the one, where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. That qualifies the four, right? The land is good. And six, the land is fat. And this was the fruit of it. Nevertheless, verse 28, the people are strong and dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. So what exactly was their crime? What exactly was their crime? Their crime wasn't in having a military strategy to reconnoiter the land. Yeah, they wanted to reconnoiter the highways and the approaches to the towns in order to lead an army in. There's nothing wrong with that. You see that throughout Scripture. Judges chapter 1, verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22. Numbers chapter 21, verse 32. Joshua 2 and Joshua 8. Many times there's a reconnaissance and then an invading force. So that wasn't the crime. What was their crime? Was it just the giving of the information that the people who dwelt there were very strong and great? Was that their crime? You see, I believe that their sin, their crime, lay in what was related when they returned. Not before they went in, but what they related when they returned. Because if we look very closely at the text, we can see that their words weren't exactly objective. They had become subjective. Therein lies their very crime. Look at verse 28. Nevertheless, nevertheless, and herein lies their sin and their crime. They acted not as neutral reconnaissance forces, but they gave their opinion on the matter and they swayed the congregation. And therein lies their sin. What we see is three things were not in their favor. Number two, number three, and number five. The inhabitants are strong and great, and the cities are walled. But, number seven, but there was no, it seemed, no righteous, so their defenses would be rendered useless. Look at chapter 14, verse 9. And Caleb and Yehoshua said, Only rebel not against Yahweh, neither fear the people of the land, for they are lechem, bread to us. Their defense is departed from them, and Yahweh is with us. Fear them not. We shall devour them. We will eat them up, and they will be our sustenance, because we will what? Plunder them. Look at chapter 13 and verse 30. And Caleb quieted the people before Moshe and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the people that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now this is very interesting, because if you actually look at the Hebrew text here, you find this Hebrew word, Mimenu, Mimenu. For they are stronger than we. And it's actually spelt with a mem, mem, noon, vav. And the interesting thing about this Hebrew word is it can mean 
we're talking about the first person plural, stronger than we, but it can also mean the third person singular, stronger than him. You see, what they were saying, that the people in the land were stronger than the third person, singular, him. And there's the key again. They were saying that the people in the land were stronger than him. Stronger than Yahweh? Are we so deluded by what's going on by our senses in this world? Do you really believe the Illuminati, the geopolitical situation, is stronger than the sovereign one? No. But they did. You see, we have got to get perspective when the hits the fan. We have got to get perspective, brethren. We have to know where our strength lies. We have to know where our strength lies. Does it lie in military? Does it lie in forces? Because you're going to see a lot of barbed wire going up and down the highways, spools and spools and spools and spools of it on the back of military trucks. You're going to see it. Many people have already seen it all across the nation, literally convoys of spools and spools and spools and spools of barbed wire. Are you going to be afraid of the military presence or are you going to understand that he is stronger than it all? But you've got to be walking in righteousness. You've got to be walking in the righteousness. So that Hebrew word there, mimenu, does it mean first person plural? stronger than we are, or does it mean third person singular, stronger than him, Yahweh? And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search is a land that eats up its inhabitants. They changed the report. They changed the report because earlier they said what? They said the land was good. You see, so now... They've changed the report. Yahweh said back in Shemo, Exodus chapter 23, verse 1, You shall not raise a false report. Put not your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. And verse 20, See, I send a malak. He already said this. See, I send a malak, an angel, my messenger before you, to guide you in the derek, the way, to bring you into the place that I have prepared. He'd already given them the promise. He was going to render whatever defense is useless, that whatever happened, he already gave them the promise back in Shemot 23, verse 1. We have to memorize Scripture. Because we're going to be need to call upon the word of Yahweh to see us through these times. We have to remember his previous promises, his prior promises to us. We have to. We simply must. We simply must. Because what we see anyway, anyway, here, it, here lies a contradiction. Because if the land consumed its inhabit inhabitants, how did there exist men of great stature? Anyway, Right? If the land, if the land, excuse me, if the land consumed its inhabitants, how are there any men of great stature left? That's a contradiction in terms anyway. This is nothing more. This is nothing more than a bunch of propagandists spying out the land. Welcome to the 21st century. Nothing more than a bunch of propagandists spying out the land. You see, in fact, this contradiction shows you something. Shows you the worldview today. They're either doing one of two things. They're either advocating Darwin's natural selection, right? That only the fittest shall survive or they're disseminating a mixture of fact and fiction. And that is what you're seeing coming out of the land today. Both, in fact. Both, in fact. This Parsha echoes 
the last day challenge for the Joshua and Caleb's dealing with the propagandists in the land. It really does. Because his Malak would go before Israel and weaken and plague the unrighteous inhabitants. That was the reality. That was the truth. And that was the promise they'd already said in Scripture. His Malak, his messenger, would have gone before and weakened the unrighteous and plagued the unrighteous to make way for his righteous people. Look at chapter 14 and verse 1. And the entire congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moshe and against Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would to Elohim that we had died in the land of Mitzrayim. Careful. You've got to be really careful what you request, because guess what? It was granted to them in verse 28, was it not? I get very nervous when people come around me and they're sitting down at my table and they say, I am starving. I mean, I really do. I really do. Because it's only three days until the grocery stores are totally depleted. And the trucks, you know how far the average produce is shipped to get to the grocery stores? You know how quick that expensive bottled water will run out. I get very nervous when people are surrounded by plenty and they say, I'm starving. Be careful what you speak, abracadabra. Or would to Elohim that we had died in the wilderness. And why has Yahweh brought us to this land? To kill us by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Is it not better for us to return to Mitzrayim? So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Mitzrayim. What about Yahweh? I thought Yahweh was their leader. You see, the spies, this is just a revolt. This is just a revolt. Three things to look for. Number one, they had a crisis of faith. You see, the golden calf was still religious. Oh, but not here. They actually lost all hope. They denied the past, the promise back in Shemot, and they contested the very attributes of Yahweh. They contested his very attributes. Look at chapter 14, verse 17. Seven of the 13 attributes of Yahweh are petitioned in intercessory prayer by Moshe Rabbeinu. But within this revolt, look at the second thing, fear. Where did this fear come? They had too many years in the Midbar, in the wilderness, in the exile. They'd been actually overcome by it. How many people today are overcome by the nations that they live in? Are you overcome by the United States of America? Are you overcome by South Africa? Are you overcome by England? wherever you live? Are you overcome by the nation of where you dwell? Or do you still have the vision? Because the first question they asked the master was, Master, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And we're talking biblical Israel. Don't be overcome. Do not be overcome by the nations in which you dwell. Because that is how the knees buckle and the liver twitches and you become weak. Whatever that meant. <laughs> Twitching liver. I'm sure there's a teaching there. The kidneys, the reins, right? And the third thing with this revolt of the spies, and I believe this will hit the last generation, do we have the right to the land? Well, do we? Do we have the right to the land? By what right? What about the present inhabitants? Well, what about the present inhabitants? Does our conscience permit it? Yahweh demands us in this pasture to be above our strength and beneath our conscience. He demands us to be above our strength and beneath our conscience. 
It's not about your strength, and it's not about your bloody conscience. That is the stumbling block to the faith. Do you know how many people can't accept the truth of the word of Yahweh because of their conscience? Because they've got all these pre-formulated ideas on what is right and what is wrong. No, the Bible defines what's right and what's wrong. And when Yahweh said to go into a city and slay the men, the women, and the children, let's be real. They were what? They were none other than the offspring of the bloody watchers. They were the Nephilim. They were the crossbreed. So Yahweh said, slay them all so it doesn't pollute my seed line, which will bring forth the Messiah. But we don't understand that, and our conscience doesn't even allow us to grasp hold of the promises and inheritance of Yahweh. So leave your conscience at the door and pick up his consciousness. That's the only consciousness you can trust. Not the bloody Dalai Lamas, not some spiritual guru, but literally what is revealed through the Ruach HaKodesh and the Kadosh scripture of Yahweh. You see, we need to be above our strength and beneath our conscience. We are to occupy the land differently than other nations. Not just establish a community, but a community that can farm together, school together, work together, and live Yeshua. Covenant Torah in his royal priesthood together. That's what we're to do. If you, if you live by your conscience to please messianic interpretations of Israel or Jewish interpretation of who's Israel, then we'll never have the Gevurah, the courage to occupy the land. It's not the permitted land for crying out loud. It's the promised land. Look at my because Moshe's intercession is very, very telling. Because there was another place back in Scripture, if we can remember Scripture, there's my start, where Moshe interceded. Where did he intercede for this? None other than at the sin of the golden calf breach, Exodus 32. So we need to compare the two intercessions. We need to compare the intercession here in our text with the spies and we need to compare the intercession at the golden calf because it's going to be very telling for the Malkitzedic remnant returning to the Malkitzedic covenant by these two intercessions. It tells a great story in itself. Verse 13 of chapter 14. And Moshe said to Yahweh, Then the Mitzrim shall hear it, for you brought up this people in your might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that you, Yahweh, are among this people, that you, Yahweh, have seen face to face, and that your cloud stands over them, and that you go before them by day in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you shall kill this entire people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will speak, saying, because Yahweh was not able to bring his people into the land which he swore to them. Therefore, he has slain them in the wilderness. If you compare Moshe's two intercessions, this intercession is far lengthier and far more detailed than the intercession back in Shemo, Exodus 32. This is far longer in the text. When Moshe interceded at the golden calf, he brought forth three arguments. Three arguments. Whereas here, he only brings forth one argument. It's identifying those two other arguments at the golden calf intercessionary breach that qualify, identify, and demonstrate to you and I who are following the order of the Malkitzedic, understanding the break between the book of the covenant and the book of the law, that we are on the narrow path of righteous truth that leads to life. Because we need to identify the two arguments that were brought forth back at the golden calf breach that aren't brought forth here and question, well, why? Three arguments that were brought forth back at the golden calf. Number one, Yahweh's proverbial love. 
his proverbial love. Number two, what's called Hillel Hashem, the bringing forth, the desecration of the name of Yahweh. Hillel Hashem. Well, Yahweh, if you slay us in the wilderness, then what will the nations say of your great name? And number three, the merit of the patriarchs and the covenant. You see, the intercession here at Numbers 14, 13 is by far longer and more detailed than Exodus 32. But in stark contrast, only one single argument is employed here in the text. Hillel Hashem. Yahweh, we don't want your name desecrated. Whereas back at Shemot, Exodus 32, three arguments are brought forth. Number one, Yahweh's proverbial love for his bride. Because remember, back in Shemot 19, what had he done? He had proposed to his bride and they had accepted. So at the breach, he reminds them that he loved them, that he married them. And number two, Hillel Hashem, desecrate the name. And number three, at the golden calf breach, remember the book of the covenant that was sealed with the blood? The covenant of the patriarchs that was given to Abraham, sworn in an oath in Genesis 12, given to him in Genesis 15, and then ratified here with the book of the covenant in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, through to 24, verse 11. And Yahweh brings it up, Moshe, excuse me, brings it up as a petition to Yahweh as his three arguments. That tells us what happened at the golden calf breach and why it is not included here. All we have included here is one of the arguments. That is very, very powerful. Very powerful. Selah. Look at chapter 14 and verse 39. All the way through to chapter 15. We're going to see land entrance. When they decided to go up a little bit later, what did they not have with them? And this is what qualified them as none other than Ma'apalim, illegal immigrants. You are an illegal immigrant if you do not have the ark with you. You are an illegal immigrant if you... What is contained in the ark, by the way? The Book of the Covenant, thank you. You are an illegal immigrant if you try to get into the land without the ark containing the Book of the Covenant. You are an illegal immigrant if you go up into the land without the mediator. We no longer have the mediator, Moshe. We have the greater mediator, the Kohen Haggadah, after the order of Malkit Tzadik Yeshua himself. And you are an illegal immigrant because if you don't have those first two, you won't have the third, which is the Ruach HaKodesh, is very present. That is the definition of an illegal immigrant trying to get into the bloody land. And that is the world that we live in today. No ark means no book of the covenant. No Moshe means no mediator. And we have a greater mediator than Moshe. And if you don't have those first two that qualify you, you certainly won't have the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh to bring down the defenses of your enemies. We have to understand that, yes, 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 this is not something in the past. This is your very future. This is your very life. The Torah has got more to do today with your presence and your future than it does with the past. And if you don't believe that, that's because you've forgotten the promises, just like the spies. Well, I haven't forgotten the promises of Scripture. I live and hope, and very, very, my very, very sustenance each and every day is the promises of Scripture. Because the promises of this world are foolery. There is one more key ingredient to being a legal 
inhabitant of the land, gaining that land entrance, the ability to hold the birthright. You have to be able to hold the birthright, and the birthright belongs to Joseph Ephraim. The children of Joseph Ephraim are the only ones that were entitled to the name Israel. Chapter 14, verse 39. And Moshe told these sayings to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly, rose up early in the morning, and got up into the top of the mountain, saying, See, we are here. But Elohim is not in their midst. They are Israel orientated rather than what? Elohim orientated committed to occupying the land rather than fulfilling the divine will and scriptural mandate. Is anybody tracking with me? A shadow of modern Zionism. They'd already received the message that only when the ark of Yahweh went forth would Moshe say, Arise, O Yahweh, and scatter your enemies and cause those to hate you to flee before you. We already covered that with the inverted noons, did we not? Was that just last week? And the text goes on to say, And you will go up to the place which Yahweh has promised, for we have sinned, verse 41 of chapter 14. And Moshe said, Why do you now still transgress the command of Yahweh? But it, sh but it shall not prosper. Go not up, for Yahweh is not among you, that you be not smitten by your enemies. For the Amalekites, the Canaanites, are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from Yahweh. Therefore, Yahweh will not be with you. But they presumed the sin of presumption to go up to the top of the hill. Nevertheless, the ark of the testimony of Yahweh and Moshe departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites who dwelt in the hill and smote them and beat them down even unto Hormah. See, we have to understand the prophecies of Scripture. Yes, yeah, sure. A remnant of Judah had to return to the land before we did. Zechariah chapter 12. Yahweh also shall save the tents of Yehuda first, so that the Tithereth, the glory of Bet Dawid, the house of David, and the Tithereth, the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, do not magnify themselves against Yehuda. It's very important that those that dwell in Jerusalem, that those of the house of David, do not magnify themselves over Yehuda. So that is why Yehuda would go to the land first. But Israel, Israel needs to be defined scripturally. That would be the northern tribes under the leadership of Ephraim, who holds the title Israel. They will have to return, and rulership would be with them, and land rights would be with Israel. Ephraim. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 7. This says Yahweh, the Redeemer of Israel, their Kadosh one. To him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to be the Eved, the servant over rulers. Melachim, king, shall see and arise. Rulers also shall worship because of Yahweh that is faithful. And the Kadosh one of Israel, and he shall choose you. He shall choose you. This says Yahweh in an acceptable time that I have heard you. And in the day of Yeshua have I helped you. And I will preserve you and give you for a Brit, a covenant of the people, to restore the land, to cause you to inherit the desolate heritages. You see, both Obadiah and Zechariah inform us that war, that a war will only be successful in ending the problems of the land occupiers today. It will be from Ashkelon and Gaza. You see, when Joseph returns, or the bow of Judah is full with what? The arrows of Ephraim. That's when there is true 
victory with the inhabitants of the land. The bow of Yehuda has to be full with the arrows of Ephraim to bring down the strongholds of those of the surrounding nations. And we don't have that means we have none other than Ma'palim, illegal immigrants. You see, really, it's an olive tree that is bearing no fruit, which means there's going to be a nuclear war. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague with which Yahweh will plague a plague. Yes, it's a plague. With all the nations that have fought against Yerushalayim. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their very sockets. And their tongues will decay within their mouths. You see, we have to remember, Yeshua already gave us the shadow. He gave us the warning with the parable of the fig tree in Matthew chapter 21 verse 20. And Matthew chapter 24 verse 32. You see, what we have today is this nation, this nation of Israel is trying to run, but it's running a state, not a country. It's running a state, and yeah, it's putting forth leaves, yet not producing the fruits of the kingdom. Because the only way they can do that is by linking themselves with the legal air and filling their bow with the arrows of Ephraim. It's time for Yehuda, Judah, to make Teshuvah, receive Mashiach, and bear fruit, the parable of the fig tree. What's happened in 1948 is the fig tree was brought back to life, for sure, to allow it to bring forth some leaves for a season. But that season is closing. It's time, as we'll see, through the parable for that tree to be what? None other to be cut down if it still remains barren of fruit. And that's a hard message. The Christian Zionists won't know what to do. The world is going to be in a turmoil. But the prophecies of Scripture reveal to us that there is a greater plan for the restoration of the kingdom biblical Israel. Luke chapter 19, verse 14 and 28. Those who don't want me to reign over them, Yeshua said, do what? It's politically incorrect. Those that don't want Yeshua to reign over them, slay them before me. We need to understand the words of Mashiach in relation to the inhabitants that are illegally Occupy the land. We've got to look today at the division of Jerusalem and Obama and the Palestinian statehood that he's pushing. Because in Zechariah 14, verse 2, it says, For I will be, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity. There's going to be a division of the city. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. You see, two-thirds of the inhabitants are going to die. That western strip right up through Tel Aviv. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. This is so politically incorrect. But, you know, when these things happen, there's going to be a people that will understand and they will not have their liver... What did I say? Quiver. Quiver. Liver quiver. No liver quiver with the people of Israel. Zechariah 13, verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all Eretz Israel, says Yahweh, two parts in it shall be cut off and die, but the third part shall be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. And I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people and me. And they shall say, Yahweh is the name of my Elohim. 
they will no longer cry the cry that you hear from the Muslim prayers. But they will cry out, Yahweh, Hu, Akbar. Yahweh is greatest. Yahweh, Hu, Akbar. You see, Tehillim 60 verse 7. Ephraim is the strength of my head. You see, when you look at that text, it's kind of silly, isn't it, to talk about the lost tribes of Israel. What, like Yahweh's lost his head? Right? Ephraim is the strength of my head. For, for the tribes of Ephraim to be lost, that would mean that Yahweh's lost his head, and we know that's not. So he knows exactly where his head is. Number one, Judah would bring forth the Messiah, and that happened 2,000 years ago. Judaism has proclaimed more false and failed messiahs than any religion, people, or race on the whole planet. Let's be clear about that. Number two, Joseph would bear the birthright. That's future. That's future. And from the days of Yochanan HaMatbil, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent and the violent take it by force. You see, the spirit behind the Maccabees and the Hasmonean dynasty and the spirit behind the modern Middle East problems are one and the bloody same. They are. The violent taking the kingdom inheritance by force. There is no ark, there is no mediator, and there is no Ruach HaKodesh. It is Theodore Herzl's conspiracy. conspiracy. It is none other than Veraglim. Spies. 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 You see... Today's inhabitants have a problem understanding that they never had the right to the kingdom, which includes ownership of the land of Israel and its government. And they lost it to the northern kingdom of Israel when the two nations split. That's what scripture teaches. They cannot own any land without Joseph. They retain the king, which means the messianic line, but they lost the kingdom the right to rule or the government of the kingdom. Ephraim gets double the land inheritance. Ezekiel 47 verse 13. This says the master Yahweh, this shall be the border by which you shall inherit the land according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph, that's Ephraim, shall get what? Two portions. Scripture is sometimes painful to religious and political people. That's why they don't like to use it. They like to abuse it. We have to look at the two comings of the king. Yeshua has to come twice. He has to. He just simply has to come twice. Why? First, he had to come to Judah as the Lion of Judah, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. And second, he must return to Joseph in order to secure his birthright, the land of Israel. This means that Joseph must be in the land, the holy land, the promised land, in charge of it before Yeshua can come. That has to happen. Because Yeshua has to lay claim to it. You have got to go over there and prepare the land. S.A. Tan wishes the kingdom birthright to be destroyed so that Yeshua cannot return. Don't you see that? He wants to destroy the kingdom birthright. Keep it in the hands of the conspirators instead of giving it to the birthright seed because then the king will return to the land where his people reside. You see, Ephraim without Torah means you're none other than what? Amar Apalim. 
Ephraim without Torah is an illegal immigrant. So when the British, Ephraim, many of the tribes of Ephraim, those of the dispersed house of Ephraim are in the United Kingdom. I'm not talking British Israelitism, but you can look at the traits of the tribes. You can look um, at the migration patterns. And many, many people, um, I believe his name, Stephen Collins, has done fabulous work on the migration patterns of, the, of Israel. But what you see is many of Ephraim ended up in England. But when the British went to the land and they were lawless, were they legal residents? No. You see, Ephraim is just an illegal immigrant. And that is what happened with the British from 1917 to 1948. They were still, what, Ma'apalim, illegal immigrants in the land. They were the shepherds of Ephraim. Great Britain, they refused to search for biblical Israel whilst they were in the land. So what happened? Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 4 is what happened. The weak you have not strengthened. They didn't look after. They didn't look after the Fehalim. The Fehalim is the natural that never left the land. Those that converted to Islam in order to keep their vineyards and their olive groves, the Jews, had to convert to Islam so that they wouldn't go broke and lose the very thing that they clung to, the soil. They are called the Fehalim, the natural inhabitants of the land that converted to Islam in about the 8th century. What today modern history has re claimed or renamed, excuse me, as the Palestinians. You see, the British didn't strengthen them because it was a political conspiracy with Lawrence of Arabia. And you'd have to do your research on history on that and just see how corrupt it all was, what was going on with the British. You have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with full force and cruelty, you have ruled over them. That was Ephraim without Torah, the British without Torah from 1917 to 1948. So Yahweh declared, Ezekiel 34, verse 11, Indeed, I myself, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. And he is doing that and done that with his Ruach HaKodesh. He's searching his people out. Tehillim, Psalm chapter 60, verse 7. Ephraim holds Yeshua, the Rosh, the head. And Judah holds what? The keys to the history of Torah, for sure. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is the strength of my head, and Yehuda is my lawgiver. You see, if Ephraim doesn't grasp hold of covenant Torah, Ephraim will actually turn back in the tribulation. That's the thing. If Ephraim doesn't grasp covenant Torah, Ephraim will turn back and want to go back into the FEMA camp. Third birthright from Joseph. You see, the division of Joseph, Ephraim, Israel, from Judah, was a repeat action of the separation of Joseph from the rest. There has been a constant rebellion against the firstborn rites established by Yahweh down the corridor of history, and it plays this week's Torah portion into our very lives today. You see, Israel is not the restoration of biblical Israel with the present state of Israel. It's in fact, what we see, Israel is not the restoration of biblical. The present state is the rightful inheritance of what? The carnal firstborn Esau, who was given a short probation to demonstrate both to himself and to the world that he is not worthy of the responsibility nor the blessings of the firstborn heir. And that's what we have right now. It's a demonstration to show you're not worthy. You're not worthy. You're not bearing forth the fruit. Therefore, it's time for the biblical change to happen. But you are going to be given this opportunity from 1948 onwards. This is none other 
than the inheritance of the carnal firstborn Esau, given a short probationary period to demonstrate both to himself and to the world that he is not worthy of the responsibilities or the blessings of the firstborn heir. He lacks the credentials to have the stewardship over the kingdom mandate. And like unredeemed Jacob, he is claiming something that is absolutely not his, the name Israel. It's not his. Esau is not an overcomer, but a Yahweh despiser and a Messiah rejecter. Do you see the modern day equivalent? Ephraim may be new to this in comparison with Judah, but age doesn't mean seniority, does it? Reuben and Joseph, case in point. You see, like I said earlier, the Torah has more to do with your future than with your past. And we have to understand that the days that we live in are moving in towards the time where you are going to see a great change from the natural, the natural ma'apalim, illegal immigrants, to Yahweh transitioning the whole global sphere to bring in the birthright legal inhabitants into the land. And in the meantime, what we have is things are imploding all around us to set the stage for what is about to happen. So we have to understand, with the things that are going on in the nations right now, presently, what we have is we have the BRICS partners, led by Russia and China, which are the largest oil producers, and Iran. They're leading the world away from the dollar. Because the dollar was what? The universal currency for oil. So even when we got out of the gold standard, we were able to prop it up because the dollar was still the universal currency for oil. But now what you're seeing is that China, Russia, and Iran are destabilizing everything because they are trying to pull away from the dollar being the standard oil currency. Now, that is why there is going to be these wars because can we afford with the deficits that we have for a destabilization of the dollar connection to oil? Can we afford that? Can the globalists afford for that? Can the government afford that? Well, let's have a look and see. Combined with our $18 trillion deficit and our 200, and f- these are huge numbers, and our $240 trillion of unfunded mandates. What am I talking about? $240 trillion of unfunded mandates, meaning what? Social Security and Medicare. And our 1.5 quadrillion, is that really a number? 1.5 quadrillion dollar credit swap, derivatives debt, and the continual erosion of the petrodollar, the U.S. economy sits upon the precipice of collapse. It really does. Now, throw in planet 7X... And you've got more. You have got more than serious problems. You've got Jade Helm. That's what you've got. You see? You see, the U.S. is maneuvering toward war with Russia and China to preserve the petrodollar and maintain their dominance. All the while, the Zionists are lobbying support for an attack on Iran and its proxies. This is all part of Albert Pike's World War III plan and conspiracy. All planned out, all lined out. You see, what stands between Egypt and the promised land is food. Simply that. What stands between Egypt and the promised land is food. Precisely three days food. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. They went how many days? Three days. And that's exactly what stands between Egypt, the nations, and the promised land today, is three days of food. Three days of food. Three days of food in the larder. That's all that people have. 
And that means the boundaries of social control are going to quickly evaporate, which will escalate the government to do what? Extract those who would most likely lead a revolution against the power elite and their minions in Washington, D.C. You see, these are what are called the red list extractions. These are the red list extractions. Extractions under Jade Helm, then martial law, implementing both special forces and most probably the 82nd Airborne Division. You see, we have foreign troops not only entering the country in central Texas, but just up the road in the port of Portland. The Michigan National Guard and Army Reserve units were training with foreign troops just back in April. And this has all been documented and reported. You see, resurrection, when it's a metaphor, it isn't necessarily a good thing. You see, what they're doing right now is resurrection in a metaphorical way. And this is what concerns me, because back in the past, there was a bill that was brought forth for, before the Georgia State House. And in fact, the bill number, I'll give it to you, is HB 1274, and it's death penalty by guillotine. That is a Georgia State House bill, and they're trying to resurrect it. I'll read you the bill, okay? Okay. HB 1274, Death Penalty Guillotine Provisions, Section 1. The General Assembly finds that while prisoners condemned to death may wish to donate one or more of their organs for transplant, any such desire is thwarted by the fact that electrocution makes all such organs unsuitable for transplant. The intent of the General Assembly in enacting this legislation is to provide for a method of execution which is compatible with the donation of organs by a condemned prisoner is how they're selling it. They've already been installed into the FEMA trains that are running all across the nations. Have you not seen the barbed wire that's being trucked across the nations with all of the military combat vehicles, vehicles that have been coming out of Afghanistan and Iraq? The police departments and um, national departments all across the nation have. You see, this is a metaphor of resurrection, but it ain't good. Because they're trying to resurrect this house bill. Why? Because they care about organ donations. That's how they sell it. That's how they sell it. You see, today these guillotines are being manufactured by front companies in China, which are controlled by the Chinese military. The component parts are then being shipped to the Muslim Brotherhood. And then they are reshipped to Peru where the world's biggest drug cartel, the Sanchez Parades cartel, then assembles the guillotines and ships them through our southern, wide open, bloody border. So ISIS can use them and implement it throughout this nation. I think that's in the Bible, isn't it? If we would just wake up and realize that we have to be the people. You see, our hope lies in what was critical for the successful land entrance. I'm not discouraged. You see, I'm not discouraged when I see these things going on. But I am not going to be such a fool as to not address it publicly and to warn the flock. Because that's what a good shepherd does no matter what the cost is. No matter what the cost is, because there's people out there that have got ears to hear. And we're waking up, and we're waking up to the reality of the globalists, the Illuminati, and the conspirators and illegal occupants of the land. But we need to be really awake to realize that the days are very pressing. But I have hope, I have courage, and it comes from Yahweh's word. It comes from this week's very Torah portion. It comes from what makes you a legal inhabitant of the land. Because when we look, what we see, what is going to be so crucial for our hope and for our success is the correct covenant, 
the correct mediator will give you the protection and the covering of the Ruach HaKodesh to surrender and render, excuse me, the defenses of the enemy useless. Whatever weapon is formed against you, when you have the correct formula which Yahweh said, you take the ark, you make sure it's containing the book of the covenant, that you have the mediator, I will send my malak before you, the very Ruach HaKodesh, to render and the conspirators useless. That is why I believe this message of the Malkitzedic book of the covenant, the priesthood of Yeshua, the ultimate mediator, greater than Moses, and the presence and the natural outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. And I'm sorry if some of you haven't experienced the outpouring in your life, but He is here and ready to outpour all of the operations if you have already received the gift. Don't be afraid. But reach out and touch the very presence of Yahweh because he wants to equip the saints in these days. This is a cry, a cry to action, a call to action for all of us because we're not going to listen to the, la the rhetoric of the land propagandists. The veil has lifted and it's time for the children of Israel to take their inheritance. There has never been such an amazing and inspiring time to live as we live now. But you have got to reach out and grab it and you have got to overcome the giants in the land because he is with us. He truly is with us. Amen? Amen. Questions, comments, a light teaching. Our, inter our internet audience uh, just uh, wanted to let you know they're sending prayers our way. Um, we had a denial of service attack as soon as you started talking about. We had a what? Israel. A denial of service attack, which means about Israel or something to that nature. Is there a song they sing in church? That was one of the questions. Yes, there is. I can't remember it, but I s was programmed with it growing up as a child. Yeah. Yes. We, we used to have to sing songs and do prayer and assembly every morning. And then we had religious education study every afternoon. Yeah, they programmed us good. The veil has lifted. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Blessings and... Gevurah. Hazak, hazak. Be strong and courageous. Amen.